Hey, this is Greg D'Angelo from White Lion and the Legends of Classic Rock, and you are listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Turn it up. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil. It's fun, don't you agree? Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unted, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any pod catchers, like our Facebook page, or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... Greg D'Angelo, formerly, uh, formerly of White Lion. And Stephen Piercy's... Yes, a uh, solo band uh, for the album Smash. Yeah, that's right. I totally forgot about that. Um, he also has a project out called Legends of Classic Rock, along with Sean McNabb and Terry Lewis and a few other uh, band members. Um, he's also a uh, camp counselor for the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Um, really interesting interview yeah we we're glad to have him on hey let's get to this interview all right good night good night greg welcome to the nothing shocking podcast i'd like to introduce to you my co-host jeff unteed Greg, this is going to be yes, fun. how to, are you? Good. It's going to be fun to talk to you tonight. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, fantastic. Well, as we uh, hope to see the uh, light at the end of the tunnel of the COVID-19 lockdown here, um, how did you stay busy during the 2020 pandemic? Wow. How did I stay busy during the <laughs> pandemic? That's a good question. You know, it, it honestly, uh, it's been almost two years now. We're just kind of starting to get rolling again. And... Um, it's such a blur already. It's such a blur. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, my family and I kind of hunkered down, especially the first few months. And uh, we were out there uh, during this apocalyptic uh, <laughs> or apocalyptic uh, outings to Trader Joe's where everybody was masked up and mm -hmm. kind of like looking right and left for zombies to attack and all that stuff. Um, you know, luckily that faded after we realized we weren't the only living people on the planet. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and slowly, eventually we got back to 
you know, uh, something resembling normalcy. Mm. I mean, we're definitely nowhere near where we were before, but uh, and everybody's a lot more aware these days, um, especially in California, I suppose. Um, but um, I'm not answering your question. You were asking <laughs> what, what did I what did I do? Well, I, I recorded a lot of drum tracks. Mm. Um, I um, took care of a ton of stuff that was back burnered for years around my uh, house and, uh, you know, took care of uh, some projects. Um, still worked on uh, my new band, The Legends of Classic Rock. There was a lot of ancillary production work we needed to do to get our show up and running and, um, you know, still needed to kind of uh, tick off our to-do lists with that. Um, you know, it's just like anything else. Time gets away from you. You do what you, you try to make best productive use of the time that you can. And, and I did. And uh, I, I can say that we, you know, we moved forward and, uh, you know, did the best you could in a bad situation. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the Legends of Classic Rock. Yeah. Um, the origins of this whole project. How did it all work out and how did it begin? Oddly enough, you know, um, my partner in the band, Terry Luce, uh, singer, Great White and XYZ, um, and I have been friends for about 30 years. Um, upon uh, my uh, leaving um, Pride and Glory in uh, 1994, mm -hmm. um, I opened up a, a recording studio, and uh, it started, you know, very meagerly, very small, and um, Terry was my first client we were both in a low budget place in our lives and uh he needed to record some stuff and i needed to get my business rolling so um i uh brought him in he was my first client and we kind of uh had a friendship since that point and you know and stayed in touch for a couple of years and you know as as time will do sometimes you lose touch and, and him and i kind of lost touch um and just went on our own separate journeys and uh we were at an ultimate jam night um, That'd be cool. jam at the Whiskey A Go Go a mm -hmm. couple of years ago, and we happened to run e into each other and reconnected and started talking and performed together. And uh, you know, I say hey, maybe we should think about doing something. And, and it really uh, that was the germ uh, that kind of grew into what we have now. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. You along with Steve Fister, Sean McNabb, uh, Terry. Uh, Danny Johnson and Kevin Jones are the makeup of the band. Can you discuss more about the recruitment process to get this thing up and running for the lenses of classic rock? Sure. Um, well, Terry and I, you know, uh, started the band and um, we started to think about who we wanted to bring in as players. And, uh, you know, uh, I told Terry uh, straight out of the gate that, um, you know, the most important thing for me was to be was to, you know, bring in guys that I could sit in an airport with guys that I could, you know, sit, you know, sit at uh, the crappy restaurant in the airport with and have a conversation <laughs> and not, you know, and uh, real, really, you know, it's, it's the company because, you know, you start to get uh, you start to get where we are at this point in our career. And, and it's more than just getting on stage and playing and be able to being able to do what, what you need to do professionally as a musician strictly, um, you know, that's kind of a given. You, you kind of need to have that base covered, but it's uh, it's your social um, abilities and your abilities to cooperate and, um, you know, and just uh, do what you need to do on, on a human level. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, I, I didn't want anybody with, with substance problems. I didn't mm. want anybody... Uh, you know, uh, who, uh, was going to cause a lot of drama mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that, it, you know, so you talk to people and you, you figure out who's who and, and, uh, what they're all about. And, uh, given that the, the performance part is there and the musical ability is there, these are the things you look at. And, and that was really important to me. And Terry was of like mind and, um, we moved forward, uh, you know, with that general guideline. And first guy we met was, um, who we both knew for, for ages, for decades, and who we both like very much and respect, um, as with all the guys that, that we have in our band, yeah. uh, was Sean. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we met, we, uh, made an appointment to speak to Sean at a, at a NAMM show a couple of years ago. We kind of laid out what we wanted to do. 
and he immediately said he was in, uh, which was great. And um, we moved on from there. Um, we were able to uh, get in touch with Danny Johnson. And, uh, you know, Danny was a guy that uh, I grew when I grew up in New York City. I used to uh, know of him from um, playing with Axis mm -hmm. and with the Rick Derringer band. And uh, he was kind of like, you know, as a teenager, as a kid, I would look up to him and go, wow, he's a real pro and look at this guy and you know and he went on to play with the rod stewart and mm -hmm. steppenwolf and uh i was i was elated when um he said he was interested in working with us and uh and uh you know he's out of uh texas these days and um you know we're looking forward to uh getting back in the saddle with him and, and moving forward he's uh just a fantastic musician and a wonderful person um on to Kevin Jones. Kevin and I were in uh, Pride and Glory together from Leonard Skinhead into uh, Pride and Glory. Kevin was the keyboard player in Ozzy Osbourne's band. And so um, when White Lion was touring with Ozzy, um, I met Kevin then. And, you know, we used to go out uh, on days off on, and uh, after shows and go into the local bars and commandeer the uh, band's equipment. And, we, you know, with uh, <laughs> Zach Wild and. James Lomenzo, we used, we used to play, and that that band really started in 1989. And uh, I've been, I've maintained my my relationship with Kev through the years, and uh, he's a very close friend of mine. And um, and uh, you know, there really wasn't anybody else I was considering. Kevin's the guy. Oh, fantastic! And uh, and Steve Fister, Steve the Dream Machine Fister, man, what a fine. <laughs> What a what a wonderful underrated guitar player Steve is, and what a wonderful person, what a smart guy, uh, what a pleasure to have Steve in the band with us. Um, he is a neighbor, <laughs> oddly enough, <laughs> up here in the Hollywood Hills, mm. and um, I was lucky enough to run into him, and we would just kind of chat in the street for a minute here and a minute there. He invited me up for a beer one day. We chewed the fat, played me some of what he was doing. And I was really impressed with uh, who he was and, and what he was and how he plays. He's got a uh, real kind of Jeff Beck ethic mm. to his uh, playing, mm -hmm. um, which I absolutely love. Jeff is probably my favorite guitar player. Um, and um, we invited him down to come have a jam, and he came in and just floored us. He was just incredible incredibly underrated guitar player and uh i'm proud to have him oh so yeah. so cool um there are no official tour dates yet at this time what can we expect as far as a, a tour schem tour schematics and when will they be released will, will this be a like a, a fly out type of deal for you guys weekend warrior type methodology when it comes to touring and playing live shows well right now it is right now we're we're booking into um casinos and uh, performance art centers and uh, crews here and there. Uh, but we have some bigger things brewing that I, I'm hesitant to talk about because I don't want to jinx <laughs> anything. Yeah. But um, we, have, we have some bigger, some bigger things brewing uh, that would be perfect for a band like us. And, uh, you know, we're firing on all cylinders and uh, we're looking f forward to a very, very bright future. Oh, we're yeah. so excited. Are you guys looking at just being a live band, or are you looking at recording material? At this point, you know, um, what makes most sense for this band is to play, is to play live, and, yeah. uh, you know, who knows what that's going to morph into. Oh, so you cool. Know, they're, they're, every door is open. Mm, very good. Well, you know, like as Jeff, I'm going to kind of go off on yeah. what Jeff just said right there. As far as, you know, recording new music, you know, can our, ex our listeners expect... Uh, r the writing of, of new music or will you guys do covers kind of like the hookers and blow thing what what's the ultimate goal what i guess maybe what's the plan well the plan is to is to really have an established show have an established production show um that's really what's uh the main thing uh in our sites right now um we're playing music that we've all been a part of and music that uh speaks to us uh, you know, stuff that we grew up on, um, you know, stuff that we like playing, really, you know, more than anything else. And, uh, you know, that is the main criteria. 
for for our repertoire. And um, so that said, there's a lot of good, great music out there that uh, we can play and book ourselves with. Um, and to quote uh, the great Gene Simmons, you know, who the hell wants to make a new record? <laughs> 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 well said, well yeah. said. Well, let's kind of uh, detour from uh, uh, the subject and kind of go on. Um, you're also working as a counselor at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Um, how did you get involved with this camp? Is it something that you foresee yourself doing many years down the road? What what can we expect out of you when it comes to the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp? Um, I got introduced to the rock and roll fantasy camp by uh my friend tony franklin uh who asked if it was something that i would be interested in doing uh, i immediately said yes um i knew of i knew of uh fantasy camp and uh just thought it was such a wonderful opportunity for uh people to get close to musicians and to get a little taste of what it's really like to do this uh you know, for a living or on a daily basis. You know, when I was a kid, you know, the closest I could get to Jimmy Page was Cream Magazine, mm. you know, and that was it. No social media, no nothing, you know. So uh, there was always a mystery there. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people come to the camp that, you know, want to have a one-time experience. And there's a lot of people that want an in, that mm. want to understand, you know, what do I need to do to take the next step to become a, a pro musician? And it's a great... Uh, it's a great uh, training session for that. Um, like I said, you know, you'll understand more about demeanor, more about, you know, what's expected to, of you when you show up, if you really want to pursue this as a profession. Um, all kinds of things, you know. It's all, it's all about exposure, you know. Personal one-on-one -on -one experiences, there is no substitute. Mm, very good. Well, you know, that kind of brings us to the next question. As far as, like you said, the mystery, when you said the closest thing you could get to Jimmy Page was Cream Magazine, you know, with social media yeah. being what it is, uh, the mystery is kind of out of the bag now. But, you know, yeah. what also gives us the accessibility for interactions. If we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be doing this with you right now. But uh, that being said, you know, what is your preference? Do you, do, do, you, do you prefer the mystery of the old days or do you prefer the accessibility of, of the now? How does it work for you? Well, you know, I think there's good and bad, you know, um, to both. Um, not being able to get close to Jimmy Page for all those years, uh, you know, kind of made him uh, this enigma, this this superhero mm. to me. You know, I mean, Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin is my favorite band um, for great majority of my life, and um, forming an image of uh, who he is and how he plays and what he does, just based on what I, you know, the limited amount of information that was available to me, kind of allowed me to paint a picture in my head, you know, and, and as much as you fall in love with the music and the imagery and the, and the, and the limited video that was available back then and, you know, and all that stuff, you need to fill in the holes and, you know, and really in a, in a way that's a bit of a creative process as well. It is. And you kind of, uh, you know, and, and, uh, everybody, I'm sure everybody's got a little bit different take, you know, um, current world has kind of digitized it it's kind of uh you know uh eliminated uh any of those little holes that were I, actually i should i should say it, it's made it a little bit more analog but uh it's kind of smoothed over the edges <laughs> but um but um you know all those little holes that you were able to fill in by yourself you know a lot of them are gone you know now you get a clearer picture to personalities and who they are and how they are and you know while that's good in if you want a real clear picture it's it's a little bit bad in that it takes away a little bit of the mystery and there's something romantic and something that's a little bit um you know personal about uh, your being able to fill in those holes yeah well said at least, at least in my opinion uh, yeah i couldn't agree more Jeff, yeah. you got the next one. I just wanted to ask you about your your current drum set uh you know some drummers can uh i'm always amazed at you know you have different various levels of drums so you have some that just set up a real small kit and just have a you know one time and a couple cymbals and then other ones have these ginormous kits that surround them completely around what what what's your preference 
Oh, gee, I have both. I have all of it. Um, <laughs> you know, over over the the forty some odd years of doing this, um, I uh, have acquired uh, a ton of kits. You know, I purged a lot of stuff a few years back, but I'm still left with half a dozen or so kits. Um, latest of which is a wonderful kit that Drum Workshop has provided me with. Um, they are, you know, it, it, they kind of go hand in hand with my uh, with my uh, requisites for my band. You know, uh, I don't want to I don't want to have wonky hardware. I don't want to have anything that's going to get out around. You know, I want to make sure these shells are made well. I want to make sure that they can tune up right. Mm. And you know, and and DW for me has raised the bar so high that. Whenever I was traveling, if I ordered a DW kit for, for the gig, I, I know that there, it's going to be at a minimum level, which, you know, is really superior. Um, they make wonderful drums. Uh, John Good over at DW is hands-on, and uh, he takes it very personally. He makes sure everything, you know, he makes sure everything is right. And, it, it you know, and they have been... and. and Moreover, my DW kit has been the most robust kit that I've uh, that I've ever owned. You know, st- the stuff doesn't break. You know, never. Nothing ever goes wrong with them. You know, they're just fantastic, fantastic instruments. It's going to be like one of those things where you know you look back years from now and this is going to be a golden age. You know, and they have mm-hmm. a lot to do with it. They've really raised the bar on uh, quality. Uh, you know, both uh, physically and sound-wise, of uh, the instrument, and uh, and uh, I love them. They're fantastic. Now that said, I still have Ludwig kits that I love. You know, there's an inherent thing about the Ludwig drums, the snares, and everything that uh, are just right to my ear, and I gravitate towards those drums. Um, and I have I have Gretsch drums, I have Yamaha drums, I have you know. Uh, Tons of stuff. Sonar drums, you know. Um, so uh, some of them I just can't seem to get rid of for a lot of sentimental reasons, which is a kind of a pain in the ass to pick up a lot of room. <laughs> but um, yeah. but uh, you know, but they all have characteristics that I love, and uh, you know, when appropriate, I pull them off the shelf and dust them off and play them. Oh, so cool. Well, it wouldn't be who of us if we didn't talk about some of your past work. Yeah. Uh, in 2010, you joined Stephen Piercy's solo band. You recorded the Smash album and toured in support of that album. Can you talk a little bit more about your time working in the Stephen Piercy band? Sure. Um, it was a great time. Stephen is a wonderful artist. Um, he's, he is, as I've said many times before, the real deal. The guy is a rock star. Um he uh, he always <laughs> he always seems to pull it out. You know, mm-hmm. it's 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 really incredible. You know, um, the songs for Smash. He brought me in to play drums on that stuff, and uh, you know, it was a kind of a very loose atmosphere. And um, I was able to say, well, why don't we play this one like this, or why don't we swing this one a little bit more like this. And things like that. So it's you know that record's really a very eclectic record. There's a lot of uh, different feels, and you know it uh, it's a good representation of where that band was at that point in its lifespan. Um, you know, like I said, I'm a big Zeppelin freak. I think you hear a lot of that influence throughout the tracks on that record. Um, and you know, it, it's not it, you don't always have the chance to. Um, put that kind of stuff in mm-hmm. when you get brought in to do a record. You know, sometimes it's very clear cut what it needs to be. You know, but uh, when you show when when people show up with frameworks and you you know and there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of room to inject a little bit more creativity. Mm-hmm. You know, you can play something that's going to influence what the bass player is going to play or what the guitar player is going to play. And uh, I think uh, on all of our parts on that record. Uh, the interplay in that creative process was uh, prevalent. And uh, I had a good time making that record. And as far as the writing process went for that album, was the the album pretty much written by Stephen, or was it a collaborative effort? How did it work out? Stephen writes primarily with his guitar player, Eric, 
And um, I think those two guys um, primarily wrote the bulk of the, the, the material. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, you know, the chords and, and, and the melodies really didn't have a good idea of what the lyrics were. Steven likes to save that till last, <laughs> uh, if memory serves. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, as a drummer, especially if I have a, a good idea of the, of the uh, cadence of, of the, me- of the melody or, or, you know, uh, the rhythm of the lyric, it'll influence what I'll play. Um, if I don't know, a lot of the stuff I'll do is a little bit more straightforward, mm. a little safer, only to make sure that I'm not stepping on any words or anything like that. I'm very sensitive to that. I want to mm-hmm. make sure that the uh, you understand what the vocalist is saying. And, uh, you know, sometimes it makes for a little bit less interesting record, but I, I kind of pushed it a little bit on that one. Um, you know, we would it, actually we would be tracking, and I say, well, here's what I'm going to play. What do you, what are you thinking about singing here? You know, for this part, mm. the B section going into the going into the chorus. What is that? How are you going to do that? And and if he kind of gives me a melody or he gives me a rhythm of of how he's singing the lyric, it'll it'll tell me where to put the bass drum, or it'll tell me if I could do a fill, you know, or what kind of fill I should do. Mm. You know, it's it's really key into. Uh, me writing my part i i obviously i need to you know i need to know what the other guy's doing sure sure very yeah cool. Uh, your post White Lion stops have been very interesting. Yourself and James Lomenzo teamed up with Zach Wilde to create Leonard uh, Skinhead, uh, which became Pride and Glory. Um, how did that band come together? We've had James on a couple yeah. times, but we'd like to hear it from other people about the the creation of Pride and Glory. Um, and you know, let's face it, uh, I believe that uh, you had left, and then we had Brian Tishy come in. To, to to fill in for the rest of that uh, band and album. Um, why didn't you stick it out with Pride and Glory? What can you t- kind of tell us the story about the whole creation? Uh, I guess your version of it. I could tell. Yeah, I guess you know. What what do they say? There's always three versions. Here's mine, <laughs> yeah. here's mine and the truth. Um, um, I could tell you a little bit about it. You know, it was very organic. We like I said, we were on tour with Ozzy Osbourne, and. Uh, you know, we struck up a quick friendship, James and I did with uh, Zach Wild, and um, went out and started just jamming, jamming Leonard Skinner and Allman Brothers songs on off days and uh, after the show sometimes. Um, and uh, we were having a good time. You know, we were having a lot of fun, mm-hmm. and we just uh, kind of, uh, very, again, very organically carried it over to... Uh, to when we were home we lived in very close proximity so we were able to jam and play together and uh eventually uh Zach had asked us to uh you know start this original band with him and we were excited and happy to do that and um for various reasons um it wasn't working out to our mutual interests and uh i decided to depart a week before we made the record mm. and um and uh that was it. Yeah, very good. Very similar yeah. to the story that James told. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's just kind of funny because uh, speaking of James, yeah, he kind of he kind of got me off guard because White Lion was the first uh, CD that I ever bought back in, uh, I don't even remember what year it was, Big Game album. And uh, I remember going to Target and getting, uh, I bought my first jam box with a CD <laughs> player on it. And I think, and that was the first album I just happened to pick up. And I've uh, been a big fan of CDs ever since. But can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I mean, I mean, maybe one of your fondest memories of playing with White Lion? One of my fond- fondest memories of playing with White Lion? Yes. Um, yeah, that's easy. Um, Madison Square Garden. Um, we opened for ACDC uh, on the 88 tour. Yeah. And we got to play, we got to play the garden. It was everything that any New York, any kid in new york that wanted to be a rock band aimed for you know um in fact uh I, you know the one thing that i remember is being in our manager's office we had just gotten off the aerosmith tour and he said okay you guys we're going we're going out with acdc first thing i asked was is there a new york date they said yes and i said is it the garden and they said yes and we just <laughs> you know there are a ton of high fives and and uh it, it felt like wow, we finally got there. 
Yeah. You know, um, it's it, and we had played the Meadowlands and we had played other big we other big arenas in the area, bigger places even. You know, but for a kid growing up in New York, that is the goal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, Greg, I have one last question for you, then we'll leave you alone for the night. Sound good? Sure. All right, so I hate covers. I, I just, I don't, I don't. I, 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 and I love them. Yeah, and he loves them, and I hate them. But there is one cover that I absolutely love, and that's Radar Love. And so when oh, we, we had James on, you know, I was, I've been so excited to ask him this question about, you know, you guys covering Radar Love, because... The White Lion version was so unique, and it it, 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 it almost sounded like you recreated that song, and, and, and you really made it yours. Yeah. And it, every time I, I see the video on YouTube or, or I, I hear it, uh, it just I, it's just something special about that cover. Um, please, James said he, you're going to be really disappointed. It really wasn't that big of a deal <laughs> when we interviewed him. But please give me something more interesting about that about that recording process of that song because there's you guys doing Radar Love. There's nothing like it. Well, you know, Radar Love came out of us us just jamming that song at Soundcheck um, over the years from from the club days on. It was just uh, a song that uh, was in our repertoire, like "Ain't Talking About Love" or uh, or I don't know what other what other tunes, what other covers we used to do as a band. There weren't very many, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but "Radar Love" was just something that we kind of gravitated towards. We used to do "Down Da 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 Down Da Da Da." What's that song? Is that a Jeff Beck song? I'm not sure. Uh, free, freeway Jam or whatever. <laughs> I, I forgot. Um, uh, we used to do that a lot too. Um, but the, uh, you know, we were we were jamming it uh, practically every night at Soundcheck. It just seemed seemed to be the go to thing. The first thing we when we picked up our instruments, you know, that's what we played. Um, and so it got to the point where we were getting ready to put the the, uh, you know, the songs together for the second record. And I think it was Mike that said, uh, what's that song that you guys jam all the time when we're doing soundcheck? And, uh, you know, we dove into it. We played it a couple of times. And um, it came together really quick. Mm. It came together really quick. I mean, um, you know, Vito had a really good handle on how to make that uh, middle section his. Everything else, you know, the other parts, the verses and the choruses are really close to what golden Earring in place it's just we played them the way we play them you know mm-hmm. it was really more about the personality of the band and who we were we didn't do any anything specific or intentional we just were white lion playing that song you know and uh again you know the middle part is reflective of that too it's 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 uh you know i guess if you would have uh hooked up uh, weight to a supercharger and then uh, mixed it with radar love. That's what you get. (laughs) Yeah. Because I got to tell you, you know, the white line version of radar love is the first time I heard it, it was like a punch in the face. I was like, wow. Now this is what I'm talking about. Um, You know, I take anything away from golden earring, but there was just something special. The band made it like their own. It it was, uh, do you ever just kind of feel like, that cover version is like, wow, we really made this song our own and we owned it. Did, did you ever feel that way? Uh, absolutely. And uh, I'm almost positive that Golden Earring is very happy that we did the song as well, um, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, uh, I think we did, you know, I mean, humbly, respectfully, I think we did a great version of that, of that song. And uh, I think it still stands up today. And, uh, it's a killer video. It was a number one video on mm-hmm. MTV. Yeah, and it had a drum and it had a drum solo in it. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, you know, and uh, I'm really proud. I'm really proud of that uh, of that cover. I, I I think the band did a great job. It it truly it was a truly amazing cover. But uh, we've come down to our, uh, a lot of time. Um, is there anything that you would like to promote or plug that we left off tonight? L O C R B A N D dot com. Legends of Classic Rock. L O C R B A N D dot com. Go check it out. Check often. And please come see us when you see us playing. Fantastic. Nice. Thank you so much. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, Take care of yourself. Fun. Thank you. All right. Bye bye now. Bye bye.